Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this edition of the NITEX Colloquium. Uh, my name is Francesco Petruccione and I'm the interim director of, uh, of NITEX. Um, today, it, it's a really a, a great pleasure uh, to introduce to you um, Dr. Wolfgang Huber. Uh, Wolfgang and I go back a long, long, long time when uh, Wolfgang was a student and I just finished my PhD. <laughs> <laughs> at the University of Freiburg in uh, in Germany, and uh, we sort of, with a colleague, sort of supervised uh, Wolfgang's masters and uh, and PhD thesis back then. Yeah, and um, and then we drifted in different directions. Yeah, Wolfgang drifted into quantitative uh, biology or bioinformatics. I don't know how you would like to define it uh, and i drifted towards uh quantum but at that time we were just both of us doing more statistical physics and computational uh, aspects of it yeah so wolfgang as i mentioned did his phd at the university in freiburg back in 1998 <clears throat> and then he went as a postdoc uh, to san jose at the ibm uh, research center there and afterwards at the german uh, cancer research center in uh, in heidelberg um, from 2004 to 2009, he was a research group leader at the European Bioinformatic Institute uh, in Cambridge in the UK. And in 2009, he moved uh, to the same, at the same institute, but at the laboratories in, uh, in, uh, in Heidelberg. And he's been there uh, since uh, 2010, 2011 uh, or so. Yeah. Uh, a few years ago, he published together with a, with a co-author a very nice textbook uh, entitled Modern Statistics for Modern Biology. And I'm not paid for that word, but uh, I can recommend it to, uh, to everyone. It's a very nice, uh, uh, nice uh, textbook. Yep. Uh, Wolfgang, uh, people are not here to listen to me, <laughs> but they are here specifically to listen to your talk. You already started sharing uh, your screen, and you're most and welcome to start with uh, with your presentation. And again, thank you very much for for being with us. And to the participants, please make use of the Q and A uh, to ask questions. And maybe at the end of the talk, I can give you the right to to ask the questions in 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 person if you prefer to do so. So, Volkan, please over to you. Thank you very much, Francesco, for these very kind words. It's a great honor to be to be, uh, to be here. Um, so, I mean, uh, Francesco mentioned our common physics roots, and in some way, I'm also still doing physics. If you think about physics the, uh, as the attempt to describe nature with mathematics, uh, but, of and, but of course, the systems that we're looking at, looking at are particularly complex. So, uh, he mentioned uh, EMBL, and I wanted to give, like, and before I start talking about the sub science substance, give a brief uh, background on the Institute because it may be of interest uh, maybe to some of you also as a potential place to look at for, for projects and so on. Uh, it's a, in fact, EMBL was founded in the 1970s, very much in the spirit uh, of CERN for physics, uh, but with the molecular biology topic as sort of its, it's a driving question. It's in the, like CERN, it's an intergovernmental research organization now it's 28 member states uh, and multiple different sites. The two biggest ones are in Cambridge, UK and Heidelberg, and there's other ones uh, with different themes uh, in, in other places as well, as you see in those, on this slide. It's a very international organization um, with recruiting from all around the world and uh, some 2000 staff or so, and actually many more um, students and master students in all of these different uh, levels of engagement. Uh, the missions uh, include fundamental research, but also scientific services. For instance, the big bioinformatics databases, uh, like genome databases of, like, like we, we, we recently made available the uh, protein structure predictions from AlphaFold as one of our databases and so on. There's a big training effort. Uh, we have conference centers and uh, training courses on all topics related to biology and theoretical biology as well, mathematical biology. Uh, as well as conferences, uh, there's tech transfer activity, as you might imagine, and also these integrating roles in leading consortia um, and sort of coordinating life sciences policies or, uh, across Europe. My particular, my, my own research group, uh, which is a team of about 
15 or so researchers sort of stands on three pillars. So we do work on sort of the foundation, statistical physics and mathematical statistics, uh, and the sort of theory behind some of the models that we are looking at. We then also translate them into tools that everybody should be able to use. Some are very sort of interested and keen in not just basically writing papers about methods, but actually making the methods available as a, as a thing that somebody can download and run on their own data. I can get back a little bit to this. Uh, and then, of course, which, which also will, will be the main subject of this talk, the biomedical and biomedical, biological and biomedical discovery operations, where we basically try to use our tools to learn new things about biology. So in the spirit of uh, sort of making methods available, um, I, I joined or co-founded and co-founded an open source project uh, for bioinformatics, which is called Bioconductor. This is an international network. You can see with the red dots here on this map, sort of all of the different sites in which it's been used. Uh, we started about 20 years ago, more than 20 years ago now, uh, with I think at the time 12 packages, one of which was mine. And in the meanwhile, we have sort of uh, developed a, a sort of very sort of explosive growth of packages. It's right now a little bit saturating because I think many of the older packages are now getting kicked out because they've become obsolete and are being replaced by, by new ones sort of with newer data types and newer methods. Uh, but by and large, it's one of the biggest offerings of software in the field of computational biology and bioinformatics. I'm sort of trying to cater two different sides of the experience, the user experience, of course, of people who want to come and download packages to get stuff done, to solve their own analytical problems, but also helping method developers by informaticians like myself to, in fact, pu publish, and call out, uh, publish and provide their methods. If you actually put a method online that people under other people want to use, you'll notice there's a lot of effort involved in, for instance, managing dependencies and making it easy to install an all sort of operating system from Linux to Windows to uh, Mac uh, and sort of keeping track of versions and uh, documentation and user questions and sort of this platform is trying to help people uh, and to in automating and formalizing many of these sort of user support and maintenance operations. Um, we do have training and the sort of networking efforts. Um, there's um, a conference that we're organizing every year. Uh, there's actually multiple conferences. There's one in sort of the global conference that takes place every year, typically in North America. Then we have sort of more regional ones. Uh, the, the European one typically is now in, in September. Those are Bioconductor Asia, I think most often in November. Uh, guess what's still missing is a Bioconductor Africa, and that's something that we should also take, uh, sort of keep in, uh, maybe at some point get started. The motivating principle, as I mentioned, uh, is both providing people with the scientifically most excellent tools to get stuff done, um, but also make it easy to, to actually get those softwares working uh, and make them well documented so that they're really um, not just black boxes, but something that you can trust and build upon. Francesco already mentioned textbooks. I don't need to get into this more. Um, much of the sort of things that I learned over the years in bioinformatics and probation biology sort of are put together here. So the, the training style here is very different from maybe traditional textbooks. It's not sort of axiomatic driven by first principles and then applications, sort of taking more like a learning what you need to know on, on a need to know basis, uh, sort of starting from different problem types, data, data types, and then sort of introducing the statistical and computational methods that you need to look at them uh, as, as you go along. And the summer school I mentioned as well, this could also potentially be interesting, perhaps for, for some of you, uh, where we sort of gather together a really interesting and powerful set of faculty uh, and, and students for a week and sort of work through the up-to-date questions of biological data analysis. Next one will be in June in Italy, in the Plaza None. So now to biological discovery in biomedicine, um, sort of a big part of, of my, my, my research 
in the end is sort of in combining machine learning and statistical data analysis uh, to cancer research. And really, in a way, in a nutshell, we want to understand how the intra and interpatient heterogeneity affects responses to anti cancer treatments. So, we have quite an arsenal of anti cancer treatment, and that arsenal is growing rapidly over the last year. So, I mean, in the 20th century, a lot was uh, basically just chemotherapy and, uh, and surgery. And now we have targeted compounds, small compounds, we have uh, immunotherapies, checkpoint uh, inhibitors, um, by specific antibodies, CAR T cells, and whatnot. So, really, an ever expanding uh, um, arsenal of anti cancer weapons, if you wish, uh, but also often very strong differences in response of patients to those treatments. And we want to understand why that is the case. Uh, if because if we do so, we can better stratify and sort of find the best strategy, uh, best uh, therapy for every patient. And also, uh, if you understand treatment resistance, we could, for instance, then uh, improve treatment response by uh, giving additional treatments, adjuvant therapies that then would, for instance, counteract the resistance mechanisms and also reduce recurrence, which is, of course, a big problem in cancer. So that even if you uh, try manage to bring down the initial cancer load that sometimes some of the residual some of the disease resides in the in the body and then pops up again after some years. Um, we sort of have a multi-disease, multi-omics and functional assay approach. So this is very many multis. So the thing is we look at different cancer entities. So here in this collaboration it's based on practical reasons. A lot of driven around lymphoid cancers and cancers of uh, sort of the a B cell lineage, but they have many different entities sort of that sort of uh, relate to which specific cells are, are affected and which body compartments. And then we use basically the whole instrumentarium of molecular biology and of, of modern biotechnologies to measure these tumors, so from genome sequencing to a transcriptome sequencing to a DNA methylation, proteomics, and to sort of look at all of the different biological layers of uh, and, and, and molecular entities that, these, uh, that characterize these systems to get a comprehensive picture of them. And in addition to these observational data, we basically take the tissue and sort of look at it in its steady state. You can also do perturbation assays. You, for instance, put drugs or other biological reagents uh, on, the, on those tumor cells and then see how the tumor responds or the cells respond. And in that way, you're sort of able to eke out even more understanding of the system compared to just looking at its steady state uh, or ground state behavior. <clears throat> sort of a big sort of baseline study that we did now some years ago uh, looked at 246 blood cancers, of which the majority was CLL, the chronic lymphocytic cancer, which is the most prevalent. Uh, uh, adult cancer. Um, we applied the whole instrumentarium of genomics to it, so genome sequencing, transcriptome sequencing, DNA methylome, and so on. In addition, a function as set of functional assays where 63 different drugs were applied to each of the tumors. So the cells, in this case, it's, it's, since it's a liquid tumor, you can draw the cells by just drawing blood from the patient. And those cells live for a while outside the body, depending on how much uh, effort you make several days. And that's good enough to um, do experiments on them, like, for instance, drug exposure uh, measurements. And that's something that we learned here on the sort of big baseline ATLAS study is uh, that many drug responses associate with these intra, with the genetic um, properties of the tumors. So, even if it's the same tumor entity, they often differ in their specific mutations. So some of the names of these mutations are listed in this, in this graphic. Uh, and uh, they, they sort of they occur recurrently in these tumors, but each patient has a specific, or each tumor has a specific profile of these mutations. And, but, and sort of they, they interact in some really complex way in a, in a network that we don't fully understand right now. Um, and was something that we saw that basically the responses to most drugs were associated with 
several of these mutations. So there's again a big network of interactions between mutations that drive tumors, because it's often multiple ones that are needed, uh, and, and the drug responses. So I mentioned that we do multi-omics, so apply all of these different omics technologies in the beginning, maybe 20 years ago, uh, one had sort of one technology at a time, and for instance, you do genome sequencing, or maybe a microarray for expression profiling, or maybe a proteomics experiment uh, to look at the protein levels. And in a way, in those cute, good old days, a lot of the data was one single table, one single matrix, where you have basically patients by features, and you can sort of do sim very nice, simple, sim simple mat matrix approaches. Because nowadays we have the technologies to do multi-omics or to apply all of the different technologies from imaging to mass spec to functional assays to all of the other omics that I mentioned. So uh, in a way, it's a lot more powerful. It was a lot more messy and that creates some specific challenges. So from a statistics point of view, having these many different data types on the same tumors is actually a bit of a, uh, can be a bit of a mess. I mean, even in a single data type, in practice, you often have uh, things like what people call batch effects, so sort of subtle drifts in the, in the instruments that sort of, for instance, the measurements that you take in one week are somewhat different from ones that you take next week, because we cannot really, in biology, calibrate our measurements like, like the proper physicists uh, calibrate meters and ampères and so on. Uh, the, the, the numbers that we measure on these most of these biological instruments are sort of often in arbitrary units, and those arbitrary units can drift over time. And that's, of course, a big prob problem, even if, even if you have one technology, but if you have multiple, that sort of just ex it gets exponentially more complicated. And of course, there's missing values. And even if you plan your experiment to do five different technologies on 200 tumors in practice, some will not work on some of them. So you end up with this sort of missing data patterns Ideally, that's random, but of course, sometimes the missingness is correlated with some reason. And then again, you have to sort of take care of this random, of this non-random missingness as well in some good way. The data types are heterogeneous, so you can't always just work on sort of like nice, normally distributed continuous data. And data is often categorical or comes in some other discrete ways. Um, and of course, the data, what the data actually measure is somewhat different in most cases from what you actually would like to measure. Sort of, there's this sort of uh, platonic cave thing that you have to infer what you really would like to know from what you can see, and it all adds a layers of, of complexity. So I hope to sort of disentangle this in some of the coming examples. So one thing uh, that we came up a few years ago that sort of seems to be quite useful is uh, what we call multi-omics factor analysis. So many of you may be familiar with a technique called PCA, a principal component analysis for single matrices, where the idea is if you have a big matrix of measurements, for instance, subjects or let's say patients times features for a single matrix, you can often do this PCA as a plot and to visualize what's going on and get at least a quick overview over the main axis of variation in your data. Now, if you have multiple matrices, uh, there's some question what you can do there. Of course, you can do multiple PCAs for each matrix by itself, and that's useful. But something that would be even more useful is to do it all at once. Uh, and then that's, it's then called a factor model. So basically trying to take your multiple observation matrices, which we, I call Y1 to Ym here, and sort of try to factorize them using view specific or data type specific w's but the common underlying z matrix so the z matrix is basically your latent space into which you map your different samples the sample stands for for instance different patient tissues or different tumors from different patients uh, and now each of these becomes a, a, a latent space representation which is basically numbers or columns in this z matrix uh, which corresponds to sort of its inherent underlying properties and then the w matrix this is tell you how the, the latent space maps back to the observation space uh, and we provided basically a method to fit this model to data uh, is quite robust and, and, and uh, user-friendly easy to use and it turns out that this is now quite quite uh, sort of widely used first line 
method that the people apply when they look at multi omics data. So what can you do with this? Um, one thing, of course, we applied this in the sort of motivated by our CLL data sets. Let's revisit that. So here we have 217 different patient tissues for which we had at least three out of four technologies uh, completely done. So 217 cases actually where we had the, the, the mutation calls of all of the tumors, plus in most cases, the, the MR, nasal expression levels, the methylation data and the, the drug response data. You can see with those gray little boxes in the left plot, there's missing data, so that's fine. You don't have to have complete observations for all patient samples, but in this case, we allowed at, at most one missing observation per patient sample. And what you can then do is basically um, run this um, factor analysis and sort of determine the underlying factors or principal axis that describe what's going on in the data. In this case, the method decided, or the statistical threshold that's built into the method decided that there's seven major factors in there uh, that may be of interest in looking at. And in fact, the first two latent factors with the highest variance loading uh, recapitulated known important certification markers. So that was sort of reassuring. Uh, in this case, they're called IGHB status and trisomy 12. I mean, the name doesn't really matter unless you're a B cell biologist. But they're basically known uh, covariates or sort of known variables that are also looked at clinically uh, and are already used to sort of stratify patients into different risk groups. Uh, and sort of what it was nice that, in fact, this unsupervised method also found those two major factors uh, in there. So that was good. But then there were five more factors, uh, F3 to F7, and sort of you're wondering what to do with them. In fact, experiences, if, if you have only one data type and find such, un, such latent factors, it's very often not that useful to follow them up because in the end, it's just another batch effect, you know, something that maybe the enzyme a batch was switched from one week to the next or that the, 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 the operator of the experiment uses somewhat different uh, incubation time after a while or changed some concentration of something else. So often these other factors are not that interesting you're just overpowered to find them with those omics data. But if you find them occurring in multiple different data types, and it's of course more, more reassuring. So because if something shows up from different, looked look at from different angles, it's more likely to be real than if it just shows up in a single data type. And that's sort of the principle. And that's why we focus on this factor four in this case, because that sort of popped up uh, in multiple different data types. And in fact, we then compared it to sort of other clinical uh, uh, annotation of these patients and that, that, that wasn't used for the unsupervised modeling. Uh, and it turned out that this factor four was in fact associated in this case with, uh, with overall survival and with time to treatment, which sort of um, are sort of two correlated clinical variables that indicate, uh, as you may imagine, the disease's aggressiveness and doubling time of lymphocytes, which again is a, is a measure of the disease aggressiveness. And basically the point here is that this new factor that hadn't really been described before, did correlate with some interesting clinical variables and that was sort of reassuring that we spent more time exploring it. And then in fact, we dived deeper again in all our different multi-omics views and looked at what the factor loadings for the W matrices sort of meant basically by reading the descriptors or the, the, the variable names on the, uh, on the rows of those Ws and doing like uh, enrichment analysis, sort of finding recurrent themes. Uh, and what you can see here uh, is sort of written up. This is basically the, the bottom line of a year of work or so. Um, for instance, that uh, there's a global DNA hypermethylation signal in this factor four, nothing local. So there's, there seem to be no specific local patterns, but just overall on average, methylation became stronger. Similar with the mutations, we didn't find any single recurring mutations associated with factor four, which was surprising, but somehow a total acquisition, a total number of mutation. So it's somehow associated with an accumulation of, of risk factors, almost no matter which ones. 
Um, a more, some more, more specific picture came from transcriptome metabolome, where we could see that it was related to oxidative, oxidative phosphorylation uh, and, and two pathways called mTOR signaling and, and MIG targets, um, which basically um, indicate a relation to um, proliferation and, and growth. Again, also this is uh, the, the metabolome data confirms that that basically this factor is associated with respiration. Um, so once you've found some pattern like this in a data set, that's really cool. Uh, but sort of to really make this fly, although interesting, I, th I think it's then important and necessary to validate it in a different data set to make sure that, if that, that whatever you've seen isn't simply a property of a 217 patient, but somehow generalizes to the disease in general. And that's shown here. So now we took this this uh, newly identified profile or, or, or characteristic and applied it to additional data sets. In that case, that were produced elsewhere, like in, in Duke and in, in San Diego and Munich. And again, found that our new certification factor also had this, had this relationship to uh, in this case time to treatment, which is a measure of measure of disease um, aggressiveness. Uh, and that sort of was a strong indication that whatever we found here wasn't just data set specific, but really uh, universal. Finally, the point is finding this new certification factor in this disease was sort of quite complex, also expensive because of all of these different technologies used and used uh, sort of expensive technologies and also sort of quite complicated statistical techniques to actually find it. That's all good, but of course, um, when you want to apply it in practice, you want something, often want something simple. Uh, it turns out that once you know what you're looking for, you can actually find surrogates or proxies or sort of measures of this underlying factor four that are much simpler. And for instance, it turns out that you can uh, already predict or compute this factor four coordinates in the latent space only from the RNA-seq data or the DNA methylation data alone. And that's nice. So the thing is, people didn't find this factor four based on the rna data beforehand, because it may somehow it was too subtle, too hidden. But once we knew how to find it from the multi-omics data, uh, we could then sort of reverse engineer the RNA analysis and, and just find it from, a, uh, from those data types alone. So as a result from this of this study, we could basically find a new biological axis of heterogeneity in this disease. And as I mentioned, it's a fairly prevalent disease, so it, there's some utility to this. Uh, existing, uh, pre-existing was a dichotomy in this disease, sort of uh, along the y-axis of this graph. So this um, cell of origin or mutated and unmutated IgHV distinction that already had been used in clinical uh, uh, diagnosis and certification. And now we found this additional certification factor proliferative drive, as we are called it. So CLPD uh, is now uh, the name for this factor four. That seems to have as strong uh, certification strength or sort of effect size as the pre-existing certification principle. And also is pretty much orthogonal to it that we now can actually get a better certification of our patients into those sort of different regions in this two-dimensional space than before when it was one-dimensional. And as I mentioned, uh, there's a potential to use this uh, now, for instance, for terror by that uh, it suggests that certain patients uh, would prof pro profit more or less, for instance, from particular drugs the target mTOR bed proteins, which are in fact clinically used drugs uh, in, in leukemias. But that, that was a nice sort of basic science uh, study. It was done on sort of archived material from the biobank in a retrospective manner. Sort of in, in uh, medical science, the, 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 uh, the gold standard or something that you can, uh, can aspire to is of course prospective trials that can actually predict something uh, in a prospective setting. And that's what, what we try to do here. So here in the SMART trial, the idea was that we could apply our ex vivo drug response testing assay uh, in a prospective way. So basically a patient goes 
comes to the clinic, gets blood drawn, uh, the blood cells are transported to the lab, uh, apply, sub, uh, submitted to this drug response assay, and then uh, the drug responses are measured, and then the idea is to give this back to the treating physician, in this case within, 70, within seven days. Uh, that trial was successful enough, so we did actually meet this primary endpoint, at least in this case for 90% of patients. Uh, we could provide the report back to the doctor within seven working days. Uh, and we also could, in fact, find that in some cases the drug response ex vivo in the assay is predictive of the drug response of the patient uh, for therapy that they will later get. So here you see two couple of my plots. Uh, I, I suppose, I, I, I assume that you're familiar with reading them. Basically, they show the survival probabilities uh, observed on, on two different patient groups. And the two different patient groups here in this case were formed by their ex vivo in the assay drug response of their samples. And you can basically see that that ex vivo result, which was basically available a week after uh, taking, the, taking the blood sample, was quite predictive of the outcome of the therapy in those patients uh, as measured in years. Here's one particular striking example. Uh, um, a patient that was um, had progressive disease, so the disease didn't go back. It, it sort of was growing even during uh, the therapy with antibody and chemotherapy. That this is RDHAP means it's basically a state-of-the-art therapy for this for this disease uh, using sort of some of the most advanced drugs. And if the disease still progresses or still doesn't go away with this treatment, it's actually usually pretty bad. And that person was in a pretty desperate state. Uh, the assay indicated a response to pralatrexate, which is a fairly old drug that uh, wouldn't really be tried anymore um, at that stage on patients or in, on a patient, but given this really striking ex vivo drug response, uh, that therapy was tested or sort of tried in a sort of last ditch attempt on that patient. It turns out that they did respond in vivo as well as the ex vivo assay predicted. Uh, there was a strong remission of the tumor mass reduced. Uh, well enough to make the, the patient eligible for an allogenic stem cell transplantation, uh, which is a, is a curative process, but has sort of is very demanding and sort of can only be done if the tumor load is not too high. Uh, and now the patient is an ongoing remission for 36 months, which is really a fantastic outcome. So, so far I've focused on the between patient variability. Um, sort of pretending that each tumor in a single patient is sort of a single thing. But of course, we all know that there's big heterogeneity within tumors um, because sort of tumor genesis is sort of something like evolution and fast forward. And you can imagine there's a whole evolutionary tree of uh, aggressive tumor clones that are massing in, a, in, a, in such a patient's body. <clears throat> now we have assayers to investigate this, and I'm just sort of mentioning a couple of keywords here. So we, we basically can do side seek, which is a combination of RNA sequencing and measuring surface epitopes, so the proteins on the top of the tumor cells, but that are different indicators of, of cell type and cell states. They were sort of very well sort of used in, in immunology for classifying cell types. And in addition, we can also do something which is called codex, which I'll come back to in a minute, also to get this, get a better overview over this intra heterogeneity, which in many cases is, is decisive for, for, for treatment response. So one thing we can do is uh, basically, again, so if it's a kind of multi-omics idea, we can try to combine different strengths of different assays. So we have the side-seek assay, which is uh, sequencing the individual cells of a tumor. Uh, deeply, and it gives you a transcriptome-wide expression profile. That means thousands of genes are measured within each cell. In addition, those 70 or so surface markers. But it's done in droplets, 
which means that you have to dissociate the tumor beforehand. So you lose all of the spatial information tumor because basically you have to first dissociate it, put each cell in a microfluidic droplet, and then do the experiment. Uh, and sort of complementary are these pathology slides, which nowadays you can do with uh, many different uh, colors. So in this case, we have a, a, an assay which does sort of multiplexed immunofluorescence, so using basically antibodies and fluorescent labels on the cells, and that gives you the expression patterns of 60, 56 different proteins uh, on those two more slides. That's great because you really get a, a picture of the tumor and it's sort of in its spatial glory and, and structure, but you only get 56 proteins. So that sort of the depth of characterization is a little bit less. You will not be able to, to distinguish certain substates of the cells. For instance, you won't necessarily see a cell cycle state or some internal signaling states only from these 56 proteins. So in a way, it's, you have a sort of spatial, but not very deep data on the right hand side and deep but spatially sort of unresolved data on the left. Of course, one idea is now that we're currently working on is to bring this together in the joint statistical model to be able to merge this and sort of project or map the deep data onto the spatial data. This is in fact work in progress and sort of uh, challenging both from a statistical and theoretical side, uh, but also from a purely um, sort of lifting data and handling data and sort of engineering side because the pictures are big you're easily talking about terabytes and and you want to analyze them collaboratively so the data may be produced in the pathology uh, department but the people that are in the tumor and the oncology also want to see them and of course the mathematicians want to look at them and then maybe also the biologists who want to do experiments and the guy in the fourth different place uh, and then probably even different institutes with different firewalls. So there's a little bit of this kind of uh, tool development necessary. You can't buy these solutions uh, yet. Uh, and, sort of, and so uh, quite a bit of our work is also just the engineering of this data sharing, containerization of software, um, and, and allowing easy, facile access to the data and uh, viewing and browsing um, on this terabyte says data set data set so that's exciting and a fun engineering a fun engineering challenge sort of complements the more mathematical modeling side of it now you can do this and here's just one example that is a proof of principle this is now a set of um, 36 slides um, like our first pilot study now we have I guess two hours of magnitude more of these slides and so now we're looking at thousands right now but uh, so that, that also gives you the idea that you have to automate what, a lot of what you do here. So each of these little squares here corresponds to one sort of image from a tumor uh, on which you have measured 50, 56 different uh, protein levels. So what you see here is basically a single color projection of a 56 dimensional multispectral image. Um, you can segment this to find the individual cells. In this case, we find some 6 million cells or so in those 36 slides. Um, so one thing you can do now, if you have segmented the cells into uh, segmented the cells, you can then measure, but just we just integrate the pixel intensities within each cell for 56 different multispectral images and get, a sort of, get sort of expression profiles for each cell. That is shown here. You can then cluster them or categorize them in some clever way. And again, this is something that we're currently doing. And this is what you see here is a good candidate for clustering, but there can be probably a number of other ones that may be also interesting. Basically, you can now get these templates. So each of these profiles corresponds to a different cell type that's um, sort of marked by expression of different combinations of different surface markers. If you use these, you can then now, for instance, now categorize your cells in the tumor into those different cell types. So now the colors no longer mean multispectral images, but they mean actually a discrete categorization of cells into cell types. And you can already see different kinds of neighborhoods. So that's the next step. And for instance, here you see like a, something which is called a follicle, sort of a particularly um, sort of active aggregation of, of uh, dividing and proliferating B cells. 
Um, and you can now apply this, of course, to all of the different tumors or different individual patients' tumors. In this image, this is just sort of a short a snapshot. I think two neighboring plots are often replicates of the same patient's tumor. You can see here, these two are quite similar. They are the replicates, but then there's some other ones. You can see very different patterns, sort of which show that uh, each tumor is different and has sort of different composition of cell types, but also potentially different sort of spatial adjacency relationships uh, and sort of local ge geographies of, uh, of how each cell type rests to each other cell type. So that that's the next sort of level in which we're currently thinking about or uh, working on a sort of how to then characterize those higher order structures in our tumors and sort of, for instance, define neighborhoods. You can, of course, just basically have a local window run over your image and within each local window count the different cell types that gives you sort of a cell type frequency matrix. Uh, and in this way, you can define cellular other neighborhoods. This is attempted here on this slide. So now this is a little bit like if you have a map of a country, of a city, you could basically look at the houses and like how big they are and how big the lawn is and uh, maybe how green the lawn is and, and how many cars are in front of the garage. And in this way, then cluster your sort of neighborhood, define different neighborhoods and how they are connected to each other. Uh, and then in the same way, we're now trying to sort of do this geography of our tumors. And again, the motivation for this is because many of the newer drugs uh, work by recruiting the immune system, the T cells, to attack the B cell tumor. So those more modern therapies work very much by uh, sort of bringing together different cell types. Because to, to be able to do this, uh, you're relying on a pre-existing arrangement of cell types, like understanding all the different ways that the for instance, the T cells and the different top types of T cells are located adjacent to the tumor uh, should correlate and, and explain variable treatment response again to modern therapies like, like um, antibody specific antibodies or CAR T cells. Right, so here this is just um, basically then to take this further, you can then see the different types of cellular neighborhoods uh, with across and within entities. I mean, for instance, something very obvious, the, the bo bottom line DLBCL, diffuse large B cell lymphoma, I can already imagine the name includes the word diffuse. So it has lost a lot of structure and many of those images are quite sort of unstructured or featureless. Whereas for instance, follicular lymphoma, which is shown here in the second row, uh, by its name, it has lots of follicles, actually more follicles than, or, uh, than, than the healthy uh, lymph nodes. So you see like this over proliferation of follicles and then there's other subtypes as well. So you can now sort of start understanding those uh, different tumor entities also in terms of their spatial, spatial geography, if you wish. So to summarize, uh, multi-omics can help discovering signals that may look faint or like batch effect in single omics. Um, this is point you don't have to use the whole expensive omics spiel and all the time if you then if you then actually learn something from this it's really good to be able to map this back to the biology then develop simpler assays uh, that then could then be rolled out for diagnosis for instance so that this goes sort of in the direction of explainable ai you don't just want a big complicated black box but in the end you would really like to understand your latent spaces and map back, map back your fear found features into something that's interpretable, measurable, and maybe, you know, um, yeah, get the, you get the point. Um, I mentioned that we now have these technologies that only really came up over the last few years to do single cell and spatially resolved omics. And it's really a good timing that we have these because we also, they, they coincide with the drugs that we're now getting that uh, sort of use the immune system, immunotherapies, uh, to fight the tumor, uh, but they rely very much on the tumor's microenvironment, so on the surrounding T cell for T cells, for instance, and T cell infiltration. Um, so there's a good pairing. We now have clinical studies that look at these drugs, and we can use single cell spatial omics to understand why, for instance, the same drug works on one patient and not the next. And I mentioned the sort of very important point of sort of open science in bioinformatics. So we don't really, so we don't want black boxes or just uh, believe me, I did something and here's the result. 
uh, our workflows need to be reproducible and rewindable by others. Uh, and open source projects like Biconductor are really instrumental in making this even possible. I'd like to thank uh, my collaborators from uh, many different um, institutes and, and sort of topic areas. Of course, the excellent uh, group, the students, the postdocs and the research scientists, and you for your attention. Yeah, Wolfgang, thank you very much for the very, very, very interesting talk. It was really, uh, really great. Thank you very much. Uh,